Thanks for hanging out, Kiri. Hi, hello, Randy. Hey, so Kiri Quackenbush, you uh, graduated just in 2019, pretty recently. Uh, you studied film and video Grand Valley, as we're here with the uh, film and video alumni chapter of the Grand Valley Alumni Association. And uh, you are doing some crazy cool stuff right now in the video games industry. Yeah, um, it's really cool. I currently work as a cinematic artist on The Sims team with EA, um, working on trailers and videos all using The Sims um, to produce things for social media and across content for EA marketing initiatives and other things that are way beyond, <laughs> way beyond just marketing, but also just for entertainment purposes. Um, it's been a wild ride. Um, like you said, I graduated last year, 2019. Um, literally a day after I graduated, I moved out to the East Coast. I was living in an Airbnb um, looking for a job. Um, I ended up working at um, Adobe as their motion graphics outreach associate for a while. Um, somebody there towards the end of um, the year for my contract position at Adobe um, recommended me for a project with Condé Nast. And they just so happened to be looking for someone who did Sims videos and Sims projects, which was crazy because I've been loving The Sims and playing it my whole life. I used to get grounded for making Sims videos way past my bedtime <laughs> when I was a kid. And um, at this point, Condé Nast was looking for someone like me. I ended up doing the project. Um, the EA representative on the team referred me to the internal team and they were like, hey, we need a cinematic artist on the Sims team. Would you like to join us? And long story short, that's my story. That's how I am where I am. And yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> Man, I, uh, we are gonna roll some tape in a second, but uh, just before we jump into that, what was that call like? Like what, when, when they asked you, you know, to come in and make some cinematics in the Sims, what, what did that feel like? Oh my gosh, my, <laughs> I'm like shaking thinking about it right now because it felt so surreal and it still feels really surreal. It's a total honor for me right now to be a part of the team. It felt like someone just reached out and said, hey, your childhood dream can be your career. Would you like to do it now? <laughs> I was like, of course, I'll do anything. <laughs> sure, I'd love to. Um, it, it really feels like a dream come true. It's crazy and it's hard, but it's very fulfilling and I, I love it. Uh, that sounds like it was just a magic time in your life. Uh, hey, let's take a look at uh, some of the type of work you do, not necessarily one that you made uh, mm -hmm. as, as your stuff will be coming out shortly, yes. um, but let's, let's take a look at that. Yeah, cool. Strangerville. This happy desert community is a great place to bring your family. Absolutely nothing bad happens here. Hello, are you there? <laughs> They're lying to you. Something bad is happening here, and it's only getting worse. People are acting uh, uh, super Whoa. weird. <laughs> Purple glowing pot plant things are sprouting up all around town. Suspicious vans and federal agents have invaded the streets. Something's up, and we're going to prove it. Choose the new aspiration Strangerville mystery. It will help guide your investigation. First things first, question the locals. Uh, maybe stick to the scientists and uh, military personnel. They know the truth. One thing everyone will tell you, something's going on in that secret lab. I mean, it's in a giant crater the size of Windenburg. Huh, it looks deserted. What was that? It came from in there. We need a key card. I can help get you one, but we'll need to gather some evidence first. Search the lab, take plenty of photos, and the locals, they're hiding something, I know it. Plant a bug on them. Then you can listen in on their secrets. With enough evidence and the right connections, that key card is yours. Open sesame! Okay, now let's see if about the... Wait, what's happening? They found me! I'm losing you! This is just the beginning! Solve the mystery of Strangerville! Experience all that this community has to offer and more. Strangerville, <laughs> it changes you. That looks like it's so much fun to make. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really love that trailer. Um, I chose that one to show for a couple of reasons. One, Strangerville is my favorite game pack for The Sims 4. I was impacted so much by that pack that honestly, I really want to go ahead and just really 
dive into it as a fan. Um, but on another note, that gameplay trailer is something that's very similar to something that I'm working on with my team right now. And I can't say anything about it, but I'm very excited about the next pack that's going to come out and what we're working on. Um, and that's the very similar kind of style to what we're working on. Our team works on several different types of trailers. So that one's a gameplay trailer. You saw how it showed all the details of how the game works and like what you click and what you go through in the game pack. Um, and we also do more like reveal cinematic style trailers, which don't have any voiceover usually, and really just, you know, just give an over an overlay or a scene to paint a picture of what the game is like. Um, and right now we're working on all of the above. And um, yeah, I really love that as an example. I love the back and forth of how it gets all spooky. And then it's also very um, happy and light. And that really is what the game is like <laughs> when you experience it. And that's why it's one of my favorites. Yeah, so to, to kind of like pull back into your process a little bit. so. You know, you're making these cinematics. You're talking about what the uh, you know what the core of the game is, what the player is going to um, experience. How do you convey that? So, video games are like a uh, interactive medium. How do you convey that in something that's you know a little less interactive, like film and video? Yeah. So, I think that that's the big question, right? Usually especially as someone who's in a typical film and video career in college, um, you don't really think about how can I apply these skills to a video game, right? But I think especially now, more and more today, games are really becoming a very cinematic entertainment experience. And um, being able to take that knowledge of film and video and apply it to an interactive context is something that really brings that to life in an entertainment way for our um, viewers and for fans alike. So um, really just honing in using things like the 180 degree rule, the rule of thirds, and applying that to a capture context within the game makes it feel just like a movie. Great, and it looks like we have uh, Carl in. Um, Carl is a professor at uh, University of uh, Wisconsin in... Ooh. Stout. Sounds great. Sounds great. I can. Yes, and we got your, your audio in. Um, Wonderful. I, I apologize for the uh, the technical issues. Um, I got forced into a Reese boot, so I'm so glad to make it in on my phone. Uh, happy to have you. Anything could happen in a love my life. I know, right? so, Carl, we were just talking about um, Kiri just, you know, a year out from college getting into the business. Um, you're working with a lot of uh, students yourself. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your place in the industry and uh, some of the stuff uh, you're doing? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I I can kind of give you a little background. Um, my my kind of tour into the games world was uh, a little circuitous route. Um, I went through about a decade of working in the industry in the legal field. So it wasn't um, it wasn't straight into the the games. It was working on doing accident reconstructions and animating um, you know, plane crashes and such. Um, and uh, I started getting into teaching, and I started doing more game jams. I can show you a couple of examples of that as well, um, but that was really my my um, my lead into the games world, and um, the, I really enjoyed the community. I really enjoyed um, being able to produce something in a very quick turnaround. Um, and so now I'm I'm teaching artists and uh, sometimes programmers how to make games. Yeah, and that quick turnaround is definitely something that we're going to talk about later throughout the industry. Um, but uh, you're talking about a game jam, so why don't you tell us what a game jam is, and we'll take a look at some of the footage from that right after. Wonderful. Yeah, so I've done about four or five different game jams, and essentially what happens is that you get a bunch of people together with different skills. There are people who are you know, skilled in art and animation or narrative or programming and development, and some people who may have a, a full-time um, career in doing web programming or front-end development and it's just kind of time to play, and you have a set time limit. It could be 24 or 48 hours. And um, I created a couple games um, with a group of very talented people. Um, one of them is called Joe versus Volcano, which I was pleased to uh, put together, um, doing a, a um, an isometric game where you jump to the music. This next one you're looking at now, um, we took the idea of Overcooked, which is a popular video game, um, and CRISPR technology. And we kind of merged those together, and we made this game in about 20 hours or so. And Scott uh, uh, Lemke was uh, my my amazing programmer, um, 
who uh, he and I put together this game that we actually played on the physical Nintendo Entertainment System. So using the uh, modifier, the challenger of um, trying to keep it simple, he had purchased a, a device that allowed you to put in a little micro SD card, and um, we, we got to play it on the original NES. The um, animation in the beginning showed um, a little double helix, and that's something I created in Maya and put it into uh, AE Sprite or A Sprite, and then um, put it into uh, he put it into the code. I, it might be the first time that it would ever went from a Maya to NES workflow. <laughs> wow, that is a little bit uh, two decades working together, huh? I know, right? And so when you have that limited time to make a, a, a game, uh, you really are, are encouraged to figure out what's possible, you know? And it, it might not be complete, it might not be perfection, but you have that opportunity just to, to try something new or learn something um, that's not in your immediate skill set. Sure, and and with video games, I'm sure everything is new all the time. You're constantly reinventing uh, code and and what you're creating and gameplay and stuff. Uh, Kiri, Carl mentioned he's working a lot in Maya, um, and you know certainly through other emulators and and coding things. What uh, programs are you using to make your cinematics and and your art? Yeah, um, well, definitely across the different um, people that we work with to create everything for our Sims videos, Maya is definitely one of them. Um, every now and then you'll need um, a custom animation for the video or otherwise just going into the game and using the animations that are already there. We have our own software that we use to um, build things up. And um, yeah, besides Maya, there's there's so many just technical things. There's a lot of Python and a lot of C Sharp that runs things and all this different code that I, I don't even understand um, to an extent that really like makes the game powerful. Um, but we really use a mix between different softwares like Maya as well as coding programs and games that, um, and game software just to blend it all into one to create an end product. Wow, yeah. Uh, looks like we have a question from YouTube. Uh, Michelle is asking, uh, looks like a question for Carl. Is it uh, CRISPR technology like for gene editing? That's the <laughs> one, that's the very one, yes. Um, in the game that you saw, uh, you were taking these little uh, strands of DNA and you could either separate or combine or flip and then um, try to match the sequence, which then once it's complete, you could uh, uh, have it go up the conveyor belt. And um, it, yeah, it was it was two very separate uh, ideas and, and mashing them together. Man, so so not just video editing, but uh, but gene editing. It's like a whole <laughs> different skill than we learned at Grand Valley. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Suzanne Zach. Suzanne asks, what advice do you have for students who want to enter the field? This is a great question for both of you. Yeah, um, I can go first. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, really focus on what you are doing in school. Um, it really makes a difference when you're out looking for jobs and you're looking for connections to refer you to those jobs. It makes a difference as to what you've been doing. Your grades are great, they matter, they're important. You should always make sure that you're doing your best in school, but really also pay attention to your extracurriculars. What you're doing outside of those classes, what you're learning from those classes that you can apply to early work. Um, definitely internships are super important. Um, even studying abroad, just getting a bigger perspective on the world so that you can apply it to your art is really important. Um, doing everything that you can related to your chosen field is really important before you go out into the world. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it sounds like you also had played a lot of games, as, as you were saying earlier, so just, just being in the medium that, uh, you know, that yeah. doing a lot in Sims. Uh, Carl, what do you tell your students and the people that you work with? Oh, Kiri nailed it. I think being able to be aware of what you're doing is very important, but also having a breadth of skills. Um, taking that class and, and like right now I'm learning about Python, um, something I never would have thought I'd be doing, but being able to automate those processes for game design has been, been really important. Um, the uh, things I tell my students right now is that my first job, my first demo reel that I created, um, included nothing from my actual schoolwork. It was all extracurricular, things that I wanted to create, um, items that I wanted to show, uh, hold up on this video really quick. I'm going to talk about that in a second, Randy. Um, that's uh, for my students' work right now. But um, the things that I showed in my, my demo reel um, for animation specifically included things like, I want to learn how to composite. 
and uh, at the time the the Star Wars Episode One came out, so we were you know playing behind the Calder Residence Center with uh, with broomstick handles and learning how to composite lightsabers and things. Um, things like that uh, show that I think that I was a little bit more effort goes into my thought process and, and doing what I want to do as opposed to just the canned schoolwork. Yeah, I've also learned, uh, I, I don't make video games myself, I'm a documentary filmmaker, but uh, I've learned that, you know, the, those skills of curiosity and, you know, learning how to learn, I think is something that, that we all found very valuable across these different uh, parts of the industry and, and in different entertainments. Uh, it all, you know, it's all difficult in, in the industry, of course. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about, uh, you know, when people get into the industry, what is it like? What is the, uh, you know, work-life balance uh, look like when you're there? Yeah, um, I can say from my experience so far, again, that it's hard, but it, if you put in the commitment and you're really dedicated to what you do, it's very fulfilling. The game industry isn't like a lot of industries, right? Um, the people in the game industry end up working on weekends because people play games on weekends, right? Um, games are something that people are always playing all the time. And especially as our technology increases and we move forwards towards the future, more and more people are playing video games, especially as we're stuck inside during COVID-19. Everybody's playing games. So it's very, very busy. The hours are long, depending on when you need the product to be out. Sometimes you'll be working a three hour day and then playing games the rest of the day, or sometimes you'll be working a 10 hour day. It really depends on what the project is and what the demand is at that time. And it really requires a lot of like focusing on, in on yourself, knowing your limits and really working with your team to make sure that everything's under control and you have a balance so that you don't get burned out. Yeah. And I'd, I'd imagine even in that, you know, short year that you've been there, there may have been, been some burnout. Um, it looks like uh, we've got a question here. Uh, so we'll come back to that idea of burnout in a second. Uh, Kiri, I know you studied in Japan. Does Japanese animation style have influence on your work? Uh, did you study abroad? Is that what that's about? Yeah, I did. Um, I studied abroad in 2017. I lived in Japan for four months and um, it was a life changing experience. I mean, I had loved Japan before that, but now I just, I always want to go back. <laughs> I always want to be there now. Um, I would say it definitely has a big impact on what I do. Um, I really love like the drama and the sadness that a lot of Japanese entertainment can portray. And I also love the really happy and crazy and silly moments. Um, I have like some work examples that I could throw in or share after the stream otherwise of some things that I've made on my own that are also Sims related that got me into this position that I can share. But um, yeah, I would say it's made a big impact on what I've, what I've been doing at this point. Yeah. Uh, Carl, uh, has travel affected you at all as you're uh, out there in, in Wisconsin? Um, you know, I, I'm in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, and oh, I Minnesota. travel over uh, across the border. So I'm anxiously uh, looking forward to this next semester of, of teaching and, and trying to accommodate all the, the social distancing and things. Um, I wish I would have had a international study. I didn't have that in my, my mindset as an opportunity or a possibility when I was going to school. But um, that and, and maybe an auto repair class as well. <laughs> the things that um, I didn't think I'd be needing uh, at the time, but now it'd be really, uh, really good to have that worldview and, um, and learn more about cultures and, and diversity. Yeah, I would say it, it sounded like that uh, question from the Facebook page was also getting to your influences. So, so maybe where do you pull influences from um, you know, in, in your work as an artist? Where I pull influences from? A lot of the times it's very sporadic. It's very impromptu. Um, one of my favorite pieces uh, didn't take me very long to create, but it was um, something that I, I called up the neighborhood kid and I said, hey, uh, let's go out and let's shoot uh, some video. Pretend you're you're being chased by a giant boulder down that hill. And he says, okay, you know, and, and he acted running down the hill. And so I put in this giant snowball, this big boulder, um, kind of like your Indiana Jones and um, things like that. I really enjoy those those moments where you can just check out for a little bit and, and jump into a piece, whether that be with film or um, with pixel art, or uh, sometimes <laughs> I even go out and mow patterns in my lawn. <laughs> oh, yeah? See it from the sky, huh? That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I'd love to add to that. Um, in working on the Sims team now, um, a lot of what I put into the shots that I do for our trailers um, really is affected by what I see in cinema. I can think always I recall Better Call Saul. I really love the ex like the cinematography in that show and the lighting and I love the dramatic angles. And um, I really like to pull that kind of stuff into my shots um, as much as I can while staying on brand, of course, because Sims is silly and not always too dramatic. Um, but I really love like all of the colors and oh my gosh, a lot that I learned from my film classes about color theory and just teal and orange, um, all of that really has applied to what I've been working on now. Wow. So, so you might say that you, you have a style, like if we looked at, you know, your cinematics, we might see you know, a lot of that teal, a lot of that blue, a little bit of style. Yeah. A lot of really colorful things. Um, usually in the trailers that we have coming up, I would say probably a lot of the ones that have like a lot of zoom on them, but are still like um, cropped back to like a medium shot, but you see like a lot of depth of field and zoom. That's that'll often probably be one of my shots <laughs> because my choice for close-ups and medium shots is always to give it kind of a more dramatic feel instead of just a clean cut feel. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember like uh, when I noticed that like, you know, a lot of my work has like a similar look to it, you know, maybe call it a style. I remember like that felt like, you know, I was, I was an artist. Like when I noticed that, you know, like, Oh, like, you know, all my shots have kind of a similar feel. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, it's a rite of passage in a little bit of way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so talking about uh, the industry again, we, we were kind of touching on burnout a little bit. Um, Carl, is that something that, that you see, uh, you know, a lot of long, long to-do lists and, you know, people at the edge of their abilities? Oh, yeah. Um, I can share with you that I've experienced burnout. Um, when I was working in the animation uh, for legal, there was oftentimes uh, deadlines that would come in. Uh, often changes in direction, um, working for a, a smaller firm um, where there isn't a chance to really uh, hand off work or share the workload, you are the responsibility. Um, I know that uh, friends who have gone into freelance or contract work might also, or start their own business even, um, feel that, that pressure. Uh, so being able to manage um, a lot of different changing needs and requirements and also keep up with uh, technical requirements and you know, changing in software because it, it constantly changes. There's new tools all the time. Um, I, I think that um, when I talk to my students about going into industry, there's a couple different approaches. One of them could be to specialize in one area and get really good at that. And chances are you, you might have to move out of the Midwest to go to one of the coasts if you want to work as, let's say, a flame or a nuke artist or um, maybe you uh, want to be more of a, a generalist. And um, that, I think, gets you to uh, apply to more positions, perhaps working in um, architecture or graphic design or web. Um, so yeah, I, I've definitely uh, felt the, the pressure and, and felt the needs of um, the clients when trying to meet those demands. And, and burnout is definitely a thing. Um, trying to set your boundaries and being able to um, know what is uh, acceptable for your personal uh, uh, workload for the week or the month. Yeah. Uh, Kiri, do you have anything to add or how has that changed during COVID maybe? Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Especially during COVID. Um, if you know me, um, I am always like a yes person when it comes to things I'm very excited about. And as I've said, I'm very excited about Sims. So combining my interests with my work makes me always want to do the very best and the very most that I can. And um, those long hours, they're so it's so easy for them to slip by sometimes when you're really like focusing on getting the shot right. And I definitely, um, I agree, it's really easy to get burnt out, even in a positive way. Even though I'm super excited and spending a lot of time on what I love, I still find myself like getting really tired or fatigued at the end of the day and that's kind of a red flag like I need to step back I need to relax and I need to kind of prioritize my day so that I get things done in a reasonable about, amount of time and not spend too much time or an overly amount of time working on things when I don't have to sure yeah that uh being able to realize that is is a skill in itself yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I understand we have a, a question from a viewer uh, Maxwell Neely says 
do you need to know programming to do sound design for video games, or can you, uh, you know, use Pro Tools and, and things that we've learned as as film and video majors? Uh, Carl, you want to tackle that? I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. Um, with uh, one of the classes I teach is the uh, senior capstone class. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that later. But in that, we partner up with um, a school uh, in Boston, um, and they have a minor or a degree in game sound. Uh, for that, they do have you know a, a very. Uh, 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 very, very good uh, program in com co compositing, composing, sorry, composing, uh, music, sound effects and things. Um, they do have uh, skills in implementing this into Unity with C Sharp. Um, so th I think that it would benefit you to learn how to do that with a little bit of programming and knowing some of the skills. Uh, there are programs that uh, have that, that, um, that bridge or that pipeline between creating the music and then implementing it in the engines. I think it's very important to um, look into those and know what those are capable of. It's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, a, uh, and we actually are uh, going to get into some uh, more audio on a, a future podcast with alumnus uh, Brian Hensley. So he's going to uh, come back in a, in a few weeks for that. So we can you know answer that question even, even more thoroughly, but thank you. Um, we have a, another question from a viewer. And that viewer is Michelle Terpstra. She says, I have friends who work in the video game industry. Years ago, they said that it's mainly young white men. Have you noticed the industry diversifying more with women and people of color? Uh, what is this culture like? Yeah, I can totally touch on that. Um, I would say that especially with um, how the media and society has been now and really pushing for this kind of change in like a big media light with the advancements of um, a lot of movements with everything that happened with George Floyd. Um, a lot of this is getting a lot of recognition and big brands are stepping up and really trying to make an impact on how this affects their viewers. Um, and I would say that within the game industry, at least on a larger scale in a company like EA, there's been huge strides made to really make an effort to diversify and make things more inclusive. Because it's true, it, it has been a white, cis male um, dominated industry. And as someone who is a double minority in this case, a person of color and a woman, um, it's very strange to kind of step into a world where, I mean, it's been on Zoom now during COVID, right? But during like big company meetings, seeing that, you know, everyone on the screen is white. Um, what, like, how do I fit into this and um, how do I make an impact? But companies are really trying to raise voices like mine and give me a position like I have on the cinematic team so that I can put in my, my opinion and like really show my art as a person of color. Um, and I think that big companies are taking steps to diversify and go in that direction, but um, it's really just the beginning. I think that there's so much more that we can do and so many more events, um, including LGBTQIA, lots of things that can be done. But I think within the company themselves, that's how you get games that represent our people. So for example, Apex Legends, I think, does a really great job at diversifying the cast and really showing inclusive inclusivity. Um, and I think more games should take approaches like that, where like their cast and their characters are very diverse. And I think that um, people are speaking about this now. I think that it's making a big difference in how companies are responding. So I think that we're going in that direction, but slowly but surely. Sure, yeah, Pro probably a long ways to go, but uh, in the right direction. Um, I, I understand too that a lot of the uh, engines and, and tools that people use, um, you you can download for free. So there mm -hmm. there is you know maybe for for the young people watching, um, the access is is available, right? You can start making your own games today, right? Yeah, uh, Carl, do you have any uh, recommendations on just just getting started? Um, yeah, I uh, I just want to quick add on to Curie's. Um, Curious observations. One one observation I've seen is uh, with teaching students in the art program for game design, it is um, in many of my classes almost 50-50, uh, which is a, a huge improvement, and it's exciting to see that that happen. It's not quite caught up with the um, the programming side yet, but it's it's slowly growing, and I, I think that adding more diversity and more viewpoints really helps to make a better product and, and has more uh, more potential for reaching other audiences. Um, 
there's so many new things that, man, I keep going back. Back when I was in school, <laughs> back in 2001, if you wanted to learn a program or talk about Maya, you had to call somebody up and say, hey, I heard that you're a studio that, that might have this. Could I come lean over your shoulder or ask you a question just to learn more? Um, and uh, now you've got Blender, which is, is open source, is, is um, free to students to download. You've got programs like Audacity for editing audio. Um, you've got Godot, which is um, a smaller but growing uh, game engine as well. So Unity, uh, Unreal, Godot, there's other ones as well, uh, Game Maker. There, there's so many more opportunities available to you now than there was you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, it, it makes it so much easier to participate in a game jam and just you know do your own thing and, and make uh, make and create and share. Uh, Carl, we have uh, some uh, of your students' work. Um, would you want to take a look at some of that and tell us what we're seeing? Yeah, I want to show you a little bit about what the students uh, that I'm teaching right now are creating. So if you could roll that, that second clip. Um, one of the classes I teach is uh, pixel and vector art. And so we start out by, by having the students make some some pixel art and talk about tile sets and, and animations and things. Um, one of the projects I did a couple uh, years ago was this uh, remake of Zelda, the original uh, NES game, and that was a blast. And so working with constraints was the main focus of that. Uh, another one was um, some uh, isometric art and learning how to work within those parameters. We did a project um, that was a side scroller to talk about how to implement basics code of having your characters jump or walk or idle. Um, and the students who never experienced code before were a little bit challenged, but I was really pleased with the outcome. Oh, these are beautiful. They're, these they're are so really different. Beautiful. There's so, so much variety in there. And one of the projects we did that was, uh, was a lot of fun is I gave students each, if you can show that last one too, if it, if it comes up, um, the students had uh, uh, were given different tiles. I had a little bit of work up to um, to to build a a map of the UW Stout campus and adjoining areas. And um, each student was assigned a building on campus, a building off campus, and then I think a piece of the water as well because there's a lake nearby. And uh, it turned out beautifully. But one of the, the main takeaways of that is working within a team because this game design is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, career. You, you can't really do all of it on your own. There's so many um, disciplines involved in being able to share art assets, share and, and learn about music, um, programming and interactivity. It's just, it, it's, um, I felt that was a really success, successful project. Kiri, what can you tell us about the teams that you work in? Oh my gosh, uh, I feel like I'm within a team, within a team, within a team, <laughs> within a team. Um, there's a lot of different people that work on a game. Um, it, I would have to reach my arm like Mr. Fantastic all the way around the world twice to reach the person who comes up with the idea for the next game. You know, a lot of people work together. There's so many moving parts to deliver a game, um, and which is why it's such hard work, which is why there's so many hours put into it, because it's really hard, especially to present what people are expecting now. Like nobody wants bad graphics anymore. Now they've seen good ones, unless you're making another deadly premonition, no one wants bad graphics, you know. Um, so people really have to work to do all the animations, to do all the textures, to make sure that it works coding wise. Um, there's a lot of different moving parts and a lot of different brains that work together to deliver an end product. Right, and, and especially with the videos that, that you're making too, you're telling a, a story and you're showing an experience. Mm -hmm. So how does like communication work where, you know, is there somebody with, with a vision or, or where does, you know, how does that video come together? Yeah, so that's a great question. I um, really love how it works, actually. It's a very, very similar to how like a small scale film production would work. We have like our producer who like get, hears from studio, like this is what we're looking for. The producer gives a pitch to basically kind of our director, who's my boss, our manager. And she's like, okay, I see your vision. She makes a shot list for us. And then um, we go at it and we create the product that everyone's envisioning and we bring it all together into one. We all review it, we make changes, and then eventually the trailer's out. 
man, it must feel so good when you, you see that out there and, you know, the news is talking about it because you're at Electronic Arts. Yeah. And do you feel that pressure, like when you're making on, you know, those huge properties like The Sims? Oh my gosh, I think so. <laughs> I think so, especially because I feel slightly more biased towards what we're working on because I just, I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be great because I've always loved Sims. But I know that fans are looking at our work and using that to determine if they want the game or not, right? And it's The Sims, which is probably one of, if not only, the biggest like life simulation platform there is. Um, and so they're looking at the work that I've, I've worked on and they're like, hey, I want this game or I don't want this game across the entire world. And that's, that's pretty crazy to think about. <laughs> Sure, yeah. Uh, Carl, when people uh, play games, right, we're talking about, you know, games that people want to play. Um, what What is that magic piece? Like what, you know, with, with a movie, you know, there's the score and, you know, what are all the things that make a, a video game its own art form and, and really fun for people to pick up? Oh, my gosh. That's what, what do you look for in a game is maybe a more simple way to ask that. That's a huge question. I think it depends. Oh, man. Um, what, what makes a good game? <laughs> Um, wow, I think it depends on the mood that I'm in when I choose a game. If I have some opportunity to sit down and play a game and invest into exploring, um, if I have, you know, I have, I have two kids at home. So if I have maybe 20 seconds alone, I can pop open a, an idle, uh, 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 a game and, and play a little bit of that. Um, there, there's so many ways to approach uh, what makes a, a good game. Um, I think that people often look to the graphics first and then making sure it doesn't break. Um, there are, are a lot of independent games that are beautiful ideas that, that might have functionality issues. So it's, it's, you kind of have to have, uh, 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 all of it in one. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd imagine being fun is, is probably a, a pretty big part of that. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks like we got a question from Mallory Patterson who says, my daughter thinks you're so incredibly cool. She said to say hi. I'll, I'll say that's for, for both of our guests here. <laughs> Thanks, hi. <laughs> oh, another question from Suzanne Zach. Uh, if someone graduates and wants to work in the industry, what are some of the first steps they could take? Mm. Sell your soul. I'm just kidding. Sell your soul. <laughs> um, Definitely, at least from recent approach from my end, um, reach out to your connections. You better have been making connections in college because that's your first step most of the time. It's really about um, who you know, in addition to your work ethic and what you're applying for. But having like idols and people to look up to, even just for advice, is so helpful. Those inter informational interviews that Suzanne's always telling you to do, they're important. <laughs> really reach out to people, ask them what it's like to work in their career. Um, really figure out what you're doing in that moment. Um, don't think too much about like where you want to end up. Like maybe in school you were super focused on being a cinematographer for Pixar or um, a director for Lucasfilm, but don't focus so much on the end goal. Focus on what you're going to do to take care of yourself now that you will enjoy that can eventually bring you up to that level. And I think that if you start there and you leverage your connections and just keep living and making more connections wisely, you will get to where you want to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, being able to leverage your connections and, and meet people to, to know what they're doing and that's gonna broaden your uh, um, horizons as well. I, I never knew that uh, legal animation was a thing until I applied for the job, you know? Um, my senior year of, uh, of, of school at uh, Grand Valley, I think my friend Angie and I went out to the um, uh, Ottawa Film Festival. We drove all the way out to Ottawa, Canada to see that, to see independent uh, short films there. Uh, I went to SIGGRAPH and volunteered uh, to learn more about computer graphics in the industry out there. Um, first, I went to New Orleans and then L.A. It was just getting your name out there and, and learning about what's possible. Um, because as a, a student, I mean, just, it's challenging. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's a very popular field. It's very challenging um, to, to get in and to maintain it. Um, so, you know, being realistic that uh, you have to have the skills 
to uh, to to continue in this field. That is very helpful information. Um, I know that working through the Alumni Association, one thing that like a lot of students ask for and, and an event we host is all about um, making demo reels. And so uh, curious, especially like, you know, you're making these teaser videos, which, you know, are kind of demo reels to some extent. Um, what advice do you have for making demo reels to young filmmakers or young, you know, video game makers? Yeah, definitely. Um, everything that you're working on is important. Even that um, little tiny project that you have that's before your final, you don't really care about it, you're in a bad group with people you don't like. Work your hardest on every single assignment that you get because everything that you make, you can put in your portfolio. And even if you don't really like what you're working on at the time, over time, you can see growth through your portfolio. And that's also something that people really like to see, like, wow, you've been working at your craft for so long and you're doing really well with this now. I love to see like your variety and your breadth of experience. Yeah, exactly like Beverly said. Your portfolio is super important if you're going into any kind of artistic field in, in game design. I mean, that's what they're going to look at. For me, in my position, they looked at like my YouTube channel, which is filled with Sims content and videos that I've made. And if I didn't have that, they wouldn't have any evidence that I can do what I do now. So really just like work on your craft and publish it, share it. Yeah. Yeah. Sharing it is, is huge. Uh, there are some things that I posted up on my website or, or on Twitter or something that it was just a doodle. It was something that, that, you know, I, I, I wanted to, to try a new tool or, or process and you, you never know who's going to latch onto that and say, yeah, that, that's really cool. I, I like that, that thing you did. And, um, you know, it might just be, uh, something that's a, a study that, um, I, you know, was tentative to even show it, to even share that. Um, so do, do share your stuff and build up your, your portfolio and build up your, um, your work. Yeah. You know, that makes me think actually, um, I personally um, had always felt kind of weird about my Sims work. I really loved showing it to my family because they thought it was really cool and they respected the art, but through high school, sometimes like people wouldn't take it seriously or they'd laugh at it. So I kept it quiet for a while going into college. I just keep making things myself and sharing them on my YouTube channel, but I didn't share it like publicly with anyone who really knew me as me. And I think it's really important to know, like, regardless of what people say, if you really like what you're working on, then you should be proud of it and you should share it because there's always going to be some niche audience who thinks the same way as you. And just like, just like Carl was saying, like, you never know who's going to see that and notice it and really want want you to do that thing for them. I didn't expect Conda Nast to want someone who made Sims videos ever in my life. Um, so <laughs> really keep working on what you love because it matters. It does. That was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> on that topic of, of showing stuff we're working on, Carl, we have a trailer for a game that you are making? Let me just do a quick uh, intro to this. I've got yeah. more video to share and it's uh, a selection of two of the senior capstone games, um, what it is, is a combination of students who are both in the computer science game design program and the BFA art game design program. And what we do is we put the students together, we mix them up into teams, and they have a whole year to, uh, a whole academic year to create a 3D video game. And for their senior capstone, uh, I wanted to share uh, two games. One's called Whisper, and one is called Umbrella Mondays. There are two classes, and there's there's many other uh, games that have been produced over the years that are, are beautiful. Um, but I wanted to show these two games as an example of uh, what some of our students are doing and what um, undergraduates uh, in game design programs can can create.
So two very different fields of games. One of them, Umbrella Mondays, was more somber, more um, working with puzzles and taking these little these little creatures and, and throwing them in the fire and they, they turn into fire sprites. And um, another one, Whisper, where you're, you're playing as the wind and you're using that mechanic to navigate around the island and to help these little shelter creatures to uh, uh, solve their little daily uh, daily troubles and strifes. <laughs> Those look like they'd be really cool to play. Uh, and, and not just play, well, but experience. Online, it so like. feel free to, to download them. <laughs> oh, well, go check it Whisper, out then, for sure. Whisper has, uh, has come significantly farther than the trailer I showed. It's got uh, much more detail. And, and um, yeah, check it out. Yeah, and uh, the... Uh, Games have progressed so far. Like just looking at those, you know, those are 3D made by students. Um, you know, Carly, you've been around the industry, you know, for for a little while. What can you tell us about like the perspective on you know technology advancing and you know game experiences advancing and you know what, what have we seen in in the history of games? Oh my gosh! So back in my day, um, the uh, the analogy people had often made was, oh, it's it, 3D modeling is like sculpting with clay. And it wasn't. It was pushing polygons, and it was math. It was very detailed. Uh, now we have um, ZBrush and, and Mudbox and game. You can actually uh, uh, sculpt. And I think that gives students opportunity to you know, sculpt and to make these, these high-definition um, models, it also creates a problem for trying to display those on um, uh, on systems that can't really afford to to display all the polygons or render them out. Um, so there's still that underlying need to understand the technology and the limitations of what's possible. Which is advancing all the time. So I think we'll, you know, maybe wrap up today talking about, you know, what are we seeing for, for the future? You know, like what uh, advances do you, do you think is coming? Uh, you know, uh, without, you know, maybe getting into specifics of, of what you're working on, Carrie, what are you excited for in this next generation of games that are coming out? And what do you see? Oh, man, I really love that games and game companies are taking more of a focus on personalizing their content to the player, like really trying to make the player feel like the game is theirs and they have their own unique experience. I think that's so cool. That's all I want in the game is just a game that feels like it's made for me. <laughs> I'm waiting for the real life Ready Player One to come out. That would be super cool. I know that we have the capability, if we spent years doing it, maybe, <laughs> to get something similar at least. And I would love to see something like that. That's what I'm hoping for. Carl, what do you see coming for the future? Hopes and dreams? Hopes and dreams. Well, I think. Um... Uh, having having played the uh, tilt brush in VR and being able to actually draw and create in a 3D space, that was that was pretty captivating. Um, I don't know that that VR is is quite there yet for um, for mass audiences, but it's got the potential. I think of um, really giving you a, a sense of being in a unique space, uh, especially for training applications. Um, I think that we're going to continue to see more and more details. I think we're going to get uh, uh, bigger and better and, and faster. Um, so we'll we'll see. I think that um, things like Steam, we're able to filter through and find games that really fit your needs or fit your your desires, is going to be um, going to be growing. Um, I really hope that indie games as well continue to grow and um, and developing new ideas and things that are new ways of challenging our minds. I, I think that's a, a perfect way to bring back what we were talking about in the beginning of this, where, you know, it's just you're constantly relearning things. And, you know, that curiosity really drives the creation that, uh, you know, people in the video games and, and in the film and video industry, um, you know, that's that's why we're in it. Just keep making new cool stuff. Yeah. Great. I think all of us are, are makers at heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's all out there, accessible, and, you know, it sounds like... Uh, you gave people some great tips on how to, you know, get out there and create with you. So thank you so much for joining us on Alumni Live. Uh, you're making, you know, the Grand Valley alumni look really good out there. So <laughs> thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Grand Valley. Yeah. Thanks to everyone watching. <laughs>